Jim Stevens, Vice President. Tonight we're uh, introducing Neil, and may that be somebody uh, that you already know, but uh, uh, Neil's first license is 1960. He's been active in Am Atlanta, I can't talk, Atlanta, Am community for many years, <laughs> having served as president of the ARFL QCWA, Atlanta Radio Club, Southeast DX Club, as well as those board positions in these clubs. As an active DXer, he has 347 countries confirmed and 12 DXCCs. Uh, he's earned a bunch of uh, uh, awards and uh, proud to still be Arabian Knights Award, Memorial Jordanian Silver Award. Uh, I don't know, but, um, also holds Commonwealth DX Awards and he is operated from 13 DXCC entities. He's a, uh, a member of the DX, DXCC honor roll. Uh, Neil is a senior beta tester for Ham Radio Deluxe and serves as an ARFL QSL manager. 59 years of Ham Radio in January 2019, still going strong. Please welcome Neil. Well, good evening, folks. It's nice to be here. I really appreciate uh, Jim Stevens, Bob Hensey, and others encouraging me to do this program. It, it took quite a while. It's a lot of fun. It's a big program, so I'm glad that we got an early start. Uh, I would ask if we could hold the questions to the end for two reasons. I want to try and get all of the program in, and I do have a hearing problem, so I have uh, asked Mr. Colby of uh, fame, remember my wife is here checking on you, and uh, to hold the question, and he'll come up to help me. He'll be the interpreter. Okay. Uh, would somebody like to do me a huge favor would somebody please go to p5 p5 is north korea and it's, it's one of the three i need and before my friend mr lamboli reminds me that one of the three that i need is scarborough reef i call it scaffold reef and he never forgets to remind me and he is the only person I know that has worked Scarborough Reef. And the other one is Prothis. So with those three, I currently have 347 uh, entities confirmed. Three more will give me 350, and then I'm retiring. <laughs> Actually, uh, Quaker Oats said to me, OK, you have 12 DFCCs. What are you going to do? I gave it careful thought for about 1.2 nanoseconds and said, I'm going to go back and do it all over again with QRP. <laughs> which, which, which made Quaker Oats very happy. Okay, so the title is The Art of QSLing and How I Learned the Hard Way. And how I learned the hard way was by messing up a lot and you, you learn to correct certain things. I've had uh, the privilege, and I'll call it a privilege, even though it's a lot of work, to work uh, as a QSL manager, besides for this club, but for a number of very large uh, V expeditions. Uh, probably the most famous one was done by my good friend, John von Loy, PA3 CXC stroke ST0. And for those of you who are new folks, S20 uh, is southern Sudan. And it's not a great place to be. The, the, the folks there are not terribly friendly. Let's put it like that. Uh, John, when he did a presentation here many years ago, he remarked that he was flying, he worked for uh, the United Nations. And uh, he was in a plane in southern Sudan and I'm sure some of you have seen that 
They're usually painted white with huge United Nations UN on the side. Doesn't matter. He was shot down three times in a UN plane. So uh, he keeps coming back for more. Okay. The old way. Now I have to lay this down. I want to thank Quaker Oates, who is the curator of the W4QO Antiquities Museum. <laughs> In the beginning, as it says, this is what you had to go to. It's called the Flying Horse Call Book. And this is from 1959. Quick Rhodes is in there. I made it the next year. But it was fun to look through here and see countries, back then they were countries, not entities, that no longer exist. Like Basuto land. I mean, this is neat. And if you went to the call book and you work a Russian station when Russia was still the USSR, there was only one entry in the book. You looked up USSR and the entry said Central Radio Club, Post Office Box 88, Moscow. That's not like that anymore. You can find any uh, Russian or one of the newer uh, countries get their information. Back then, you sent your QSL card by mail or through the bureau to Box 88 Moscow and waited and waited and waited for a return. I'm just going to set this here to get it out of the way. Actually, there are some people that still publish a call book. This is from the RSGB, Radio Society of Great Britain. They publish a call book. And if you look in here on the G0NBJ, you're going to find me. Because I took what was then called the RAE years ago and had a Class A license. Um, it wasn't bad because the at that time Great Britain or the UK Code speed was only 12 words per minute. So that was no problem. The problem was the language barrier on the written exam. But, so there are still some call books. As a matter of fact, this is the way it used to be in a call book. And for those of you who would like an antiquity, I have a number of the old lock sheets which people still use. There are a lot of people that resist digital logging. Okay. Let's talk first about mailing a QSL card. Bad QSL card. It's one of mine. It's an earlier card. Why is it bad? Simple. Call sign, that's my old call sign, my advanced call sign. On the front, you see it on the back, not there. And what that did is a QSO manager, would, when he was looking, would have to do this. So to have a good QSL card, I had this thing about eagles. All of my QSL cards have eagles on them. And this is a better QSL card. I choose to use a label in the white area. And I put some information on it that's important, like the grid square, because there are people that collect grid squares. So you want all that information on it. And then I mentioned NARFL, ARL. I use LOTW, which we'll get to, and the Southeastern DX Club. This, ladies and gentlemen, are known as IRCs, or International Reply Coupons. Uh, the United States Post Office no longer issues them. However, because they are members of the UPU, the Universal Postal Union, they have to redeem them. And it's in their manual. The problem is, 
finding somebody at the post office who, n n number one, knows what an IRC is and then how to redeem it. The last ones that I took to the post office some years ago, there were about a dozen, and they were due to expire. So I took them in, and l lucky me, the guy knew. He says, oh, I haven't seen one of these things in years. He said, only the ham radio guys use them. I said, guilty. <laughs> we used to call these monopoly money because this type of IRC was good for airmail postage. You took it to the post office, theoretically, gave it to the postal man, and he gave you an airmail stamp in exchange. Originally, it had to have the stamp of the originating entity. That's valid. That was valid, and that was valid. Now, the old ones like this and like this, if you were going to send something by air mail, you have to get them too. Now everything moves by air, theoretically. This is, originally it was not valid because there's no stamp of the origination. It is now, according to the post office, they're designed a little differently. They are valid. This is not how to send a QSL card. I got these from my friend Tom Harrell in 4XP. The names of the innocent, as they say, have been redacted. But that's, that's pretty bad. That's not the way you send a QSL card. Okay, this was something I did as an active manager little slip I put in saying thank you for the contribution, appreciate the SASC self-addressed stamped envelope, etc. Uh, haven't used any of these in quite a while because a, not a lot of QSLE is by card. It's just too darn expensive. You figure with postal rates what they are, exchange rates in other countries, it's three to five dollars for a contact. That's not in this old boy retired budget. Okay. I'm going to show you a few things, but I'm going to have to lay this down so I hope you can hear me. There is a right way and a wrong way to do a QSL card envelope. Most managers are not going to sit and peel envelopes. They're going to take something and they use a slitter. Well, if you put it in the wrong way, this happens to be the right way, and I'll show you the right way. The envelope is folded like so, the card is inserted here, and you put it in this way, not this way, because if I take this and I sit it, and the card is reversed, what happens? So the envelope and the QSL card are cut. And I hate to tell you how many QSL cards I had to paste together or envelopes or just rewrite it because it was a lot easier. The other way that's terrible is when somebody uses a number 10 business envelope and they're too lazy to get like a number 6 reply envelope and they take the same envelope that they use and they fold it like this so they get it in. What's going to happen is when this goes through the automated machines that the post office uses, it's probably going to get mangled. I won't do that, and I suggest you don't do that. Although the post office will tell you that everything goes by air, that is correct. Except if you're sending something to Zimbabwe and the airplane lands in let's say uh, Heathrow Airport in London, how it goes from there, anybody's guess. So it may take a while. <clears throat> I like to use these. Why did I get these? Because Amazon had a deal on where these things are normally expensive and I wound up paying 50 cents 
for a package of 50 envelopes. What are they? What are they? Okay. Yeah, they're right. When I send the card, I send it in like this, and I send it addressed to me, and I put it in like so. Currently, this is called a green stamp. <laughs> and this is what you use for postage now. Most stations don't want IRCs, even though they're legal, because they're just too hard to redeem. So this becomes what we call a green stamp. And the station will tell you 2GS or 3GS, depending upon what the exchange rate is. So you take it, and I always fold it like so because it protects the call report. If it gets damp or if it gets, something gets stuck, the call report's intact. Okay, enough on that. There are a... Microphone. Thank you, Steve. Steve will keep me straight. There are a plethora of logging programs. Most of them are Windows-based. However, we don't want the Mac boys to feel left out. So there are Mac programs and anyone works. I've just been using Ham Radio Deluxe for a long time when it was a free uh, program. It's not anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I'm now, a, I have been for about the past four or five years a beta tester and you talk about an exercise in frustration because until you, if you use HRD and you get the finished product, there's a lot goes behind the line. So, besides Mac, even for the Linux fans, there are a couple of programs, and this may not be all of them, but this is what the ARRL says works. Okay. <clears throat> there are several bureaus. The ARRL has an outgoing bureau. And an outgoing bureau is only for ARRL members. I encourage everybody to join the ARRL. You have to be an ARRL member to use the outgoing bureau. You can send cards to DX stations if they have a bureau. Don't be in a rush because it takes forever and nine weeks for a card to come back. My record, as I mentioned uh, in here, further on, was 14 years. <laughs> Usually I remember contacts, but when this one came in, I said, when did I work this guy? Look, I said, oh my God, 14 years ago, he came in by the Bureau. Uh, okay, it's only for DX stations. There are two exceptions to this, and that is if the DX station has a stateside manager, like if I was a manager for ST0, you could send the card through the Bureau to me if you didn't want to send it direct. Okay, not all of the countries participate. There are about 30 that do not have a Bureau. And if you're interested, I have a printout up here, thanks to Jim for doing those for me, of the uh, entities, I still call them countries, but they're entities, that do not have a Bureau. Okay. The cost is by the pound, or the ounce, and cards, cards must be sorted. In other words, it's two dollars for ten or fewer cards, three bucks for eleven to twenty, and then it goes by weight. I know somebody's going to say, but the ARL charges ten dollars extra. Wrong. It was removed May 15th of this year. They rescinded the $10 surcharge because they had a furor from the members. You must sort the cards by prefix. I've used the example of G, which is the United Kingdom, England, or Scotland, any of them. You sort with G. You also, for example, the prefix of M, as in Mike, or the number 2, are also the UK. So you will put them in as if they were a G. Why? Because when the sorter gets them, they have to be in, in the order 
of uh, the way the listing is by the league, they have high-tech people who stand there. You remember the old pigeonholes in the post office? And they, they sit there and they, they pitch them in. They will send the cards out quarterly. It goes to whatever bureau is. When the bureau gets it, wherever, who knows how long it's going to take for that to apply. As I said, my record was 14 years. Some clubs will group cards and it saves money by doing that. Uh, don't send contest QSL cards, even though they like to do that because it's going to take forever. It's not for everyone. This is the form you fill out. In the past, you sent a photocopy uh, or the label from QST Magazine to show that you were made a member. They now require this form. It's on the ARL's website and it tells you how to address them. If you don't send the, the fee, they'll probably drop you a note and say, hey, you forgot to send the money. If you don't answer it within a reasonable time, your cards go into the circular file. The incoming bureau, this is a free benefit for any hand. Okay, the fourth call area has two bureaus, and the usage is by the prefix of your call sign. If your call sign is not in the fourth call area, like Wes, I'm not picking on Wes, but I have to know he's a W3, you have to go to the, look it up and see where your uh, bureau is. If your prefix contains one letter, like mine, N4, K4, Whiskey 4, your bureau is the Carolina DX Association. You go and you can determine who your sorter is. If your call starts with a two-letter prefix, such as Alpha, Alpha 4, etc., use the Sterling Park Club. Different. They have some people who uh, want cash accounts rather than an envelope. So, either use a 5x7 or a 6x9 envelope, nothing larger. And you need to contact your sorter to find out how they wish to handle it. I worked with Paul Greaves for many years and we've struck up a great relationship. Always use the new forever stamps because if rates change, they're going to work. And normally I'll put a couple of bucks in when I send something to Paul to cover for people that don't send enough in. And periodically he'll send me on his own uh, a couple of QSL cards in just a plain envelope. And he, he knows because I've given him money for postage, he'll take care of it. I number my envelopes. One of six, etc. Two of six. You'll see a big picture of it. It helps me, but most sorters will let you know if your envelope count is low. Your call sign should appear in the upper left-hand corner in large, plain letters, because that's how the sorter keeps track of the envelopes. And here's a great example. It has my call sign. And I put this here that I'll pick up any additional postage. And they didn't run it through the canceling machine. They did that at the post office. OK, some do's and don'ts. Make sure you have enough envelopes. And re 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 reply, you may have to drink some water, to any request. Let them know if you change your call sign. And make sure that you respond promptly and notify them if you don't want your cards anymore because they won't keep them, they'll pitch them. And don't expect cards to arrive for a long time. It's slow. Most cards take well over a year, not unusual. And don't send your outgoing DX cards to the incoming bureau. It doesn't work. They're not even going to send them back to you. They'll probably pitch them. Okay. Don't send any SASCs, 
I have some right here. Thank you, Jim. Uh, to the Bureau. And now, for example, if you have a portable operation like N4F and stroke one, meaning I'm up in New England someplace, it doesn't go to the one bureau. It still goes to the four bureau, whichever one you're using. Also, try to avoid, I know it's difficult, to find envelopes without a clip or clasp closure. Post office doesn't like them because they say it jams up uh, the sorting machines that they have. So they are hard to come by. So what I do is I take the clasp over after I close the envelope, or I'll do that before I put the sticky on it. So that's what you need to do. This is a service, folks. It's provided to all of us. It doesn't require membership, but you should be a member of the league because with all the faults that they have, it's still our league, and they do some good for us. Remember that the Bureau is staffed by volunteers. Please don't forget that. This, folks, is by far the best thing the ARRL has done for the DXer. And I admit that DXing is a sickness. <laughs> the only cure is to work P5. <laughs> okay, Logbook of the World is outstanding. I love it. A lot of the DX stations don't like it because they say I have to pay for an award. Well, you had to do that anyway. So that's just a, an excuse. What is it? It is a repository for your log. It is not a logging program. It is a repository. And it people, comes in from people all over the world. It's not much different than keeping a paper log, as I did for many years. My first electronic program, which is, uh, unfortunately, it was a good one, the defunct DX base. And it was actually written by two fellows in Atlanta, W8ZF, Dean Fredrickson and Jack Lennox, AA4LU. Great guys, but they finally gave it up because it was too hard for them to keep it up. When two stations exchange QSL cards, they are sharing the information that's common to their contact. It could be logbook to logbook. And LOTW is double blind, which means I can't see their logbook, they can't see mine. That's why it's called double blind. The logbook in your shack can only be seen by you. This is what is in an ADIF file. And I knew if Ian were here, I'm sorry he's not, because he would have nailed me and said, what's an ADIF file? An ADIF file is the type of file that logging programs read, uh, so they can read it. It's called, I had to write it down, Amateur Data Interchange Format, okay? ADIF, it's a mouthful. It's easier to say ADIF. The LLTW will read an ADIF file, also a Cabrillo file. A Cabrillo file was originally developed by Trey Garlow, who is N5KO because it was developed to make it easier to check logs in contests. That's all it's used for. Uh, ADF file is not easy to read. You can. You can read it, but it's, it's chore. So this is what's in the confirmation. There is no paper involved. It's, it's all computer. You can use at home, mobile, maritime, QSL manager, doesn't matter. And it can be set to process your logs fast. Is it secure? You bet. It requires a digital certificate that you retain from the ARRL. It's like a vault. 
How much does it cost? I know hams hate free. Right? It's free. However, LOTW does not require a membership. Anybody can use LOTW. And you can look at your log anytime. I'm checking mine a couple of times a day in LOTW and say, wow, this guy from 2014 finally uploaded his log. That's not unusual. And as people do that, being the sorry typist that I am, when I was in high school, that was one class I wish I had taken. Yeah. Well, Gary, you have another handicap. You went to Georgia Tech. <laughs> so I, uh, I found a fellow online. All right, Fred, I see you. Uh, who we were talking, he said, oh, he loves digitizing logs. I said, oh, really? I said, how would you like to enter mine? Well, how many log books do you have? I said, six. He says, no big deal. I FedExed him down because it was safe. I didn't want to lose my log books. Four days later, I get my digital log back from this guy. I said, did you sleep? You know, he's just like doing that. Wouldn't take a penny. Well, I looked up where he lived, and I found a couple of nice restaurants, and I sent him a very nice gift certificate with a note saying, thanks, take your wife out to dinner on me. So you can look at this anytime. What about application fees? There are no application fees except if you're going to go for an award. And when you go to redeem it, it's no different than when you used a paper log. LOTW does not replace QSL collecting. I still like to collect cards. When I have a new entity that I hadn't worked before, I want that card. It goes in my album, and there are 347 cards in there for all 347 entities that I have confirmed. And it doesn't do paper cards. LOTW uses software called TQSL. It works with Windows, Mac, and Linux. No problem. It's free, by the way. I know, hate free. How is it different than EQSL? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, please don't ask me anything about EQSL, because I don't know the program. I don't use it. I use LOTW. It uses a private key and a public key technology. So everything is verified. The upload is secure. It's constantly comparing what is uploaded to what's in the system. And there are no paper cards printed that have the potential to be altered. And let me tell you, I have seen cards altered. Yes, I have. They must think people are stupid, but people try. Okay, what can you do with LOTW? You can apply for awards. We'll, we'll get to this window. You can track your DXCC credits. You can look at the matrix, and I'll show you what a matrix is. You can track WAS credits. That's worked all states. You can search QSOs and QSLs. QSO, for new people, is a conversation. QSL is the acknowledgment. And you can view the QSO, uh, QSL details. It's the software that LOTW uses at your location to upload to the system. It's available for Mac. Primarily, most people are Windows users, but there are a lot of Mac guys, and I know Gary uh, is a Linux fan. Okay, this is what TQSL looks like. And there, it's a standard uh, wizard to upload. It only, TQSL 2.0, etc., uses trusted files. The files are created by TQSL, and it uses the call sign certificate, and we'll, we'll get to that. I'm not ignoring 
That's why I wanted to lay the ground. Authentication is only required when you're applying for a new account. Once you have the account set up, that's it. Wait, what do I hear about getting a postcard in the mail? That's correct. When you're setting up a new account, they want it verified. Authentication, you'll get a postcard. And it's the address that's listed in the FCC database, USL database. Non-US operators, just for information, have to do some additional things to get certified. The request is authenticated before sending the key. When you request a call sign, you're requesting a key. Yeah. Yeah. As I said, authentication only when you're asking for a new account. There are three types of files that are in TQSL. A request for a call sign certificate, response to a TQ5, and TQ8 is a signed block file that you're going to upload to LOTW. Sending your file is like sending your lockbox. TQSL unlocks it and sends it to LOTW. It encrypts the file and acts as a lock. When your lock file is received, they use the same key to unlock the box that was used to lock it at your location. The keys in the lock must match or the file can't be opened. So if there's something, the file is corrupted, won't work. Now you have to request your certificate. And you go bring up TQSL, and it will say to you, request a new certificate. You do that, and then you're going to fill out a form. That's it. Fill out a little form, and you call sign, email, et cetera, et cetera. They'll even offer to send it up for you. You can upload it directly to LOTW. So you say, yeah. After they process your TQ response, TQ6 response, all you have to do is click on it when you get the response back to the file. Because they are matched, the five and the six are matched, it must be sent and received at the same computer. Okay? Can you use this on one computer? You have, if you have 20 computers, you can use them on all of these computers. There's a backup and restore utility in TQSL that will tell you how to do it. It's pretty easy. I have this on three computers. I have my shack computer. I have one upstairs where I keep uh, the, basically track of the log. And then I have one on a laptop. And uh, I transferred them from one to the other. It's pretty easy. But I use a program like N3FJP, AC Log, Ham Radio Deluxe, QRZ, with DX Lab. How does that work? See your logging application. Everyone is a little different on how to set it up. A reminder, LOTW only accepts trusted files. And it's the software that creates the trusted file. TQ8 is the file that you are sending up to LOTW. It's encrypted and it gets loaded to LOTW. TQSL creates the TQ8 and uploads it to LOTW. Okay, this is what's in your ADIF or Cabrillo log file. It doesn't care about the operator's name or anything, other things that you may have in it. It looks call sign of the station work, the date, the time, the band, and the mode. That's it. Doesn't care about anything else. Doesn't care about, about your signal report. When we talk about time, let me mention something to you. LOTW has a window of plus or minus 30 minutes. So if you're 
timing is off. All the other stations' timing was off, and frankly, it's happened to me. And I know that my log was correct because I use uh, Meinberg, which synchronizes with the uh, cesium standard clock. And it's like uh, two hundredths of a second. It's, it's amazing. So what I had to do was I re-enter the file, change the format, five minutes, ten minutes, and what? All of a sudden it pops in because that guy was off my time. There's another program called Club Log, and I'll mention in passing Club Log is plus or minus 15 minutes, much more stringent. Okay. The TQA is similar to a QSL card. Here's a QSL card. Your call sign and entity are embedded in the certificate. It takes into account the station work, the date, time, band, mode. And the geographic information is handled in the station locations in the form that you filled out to get a certificate. So it, it's really just like a QSL card. You can, there are some uh, programs to upload and download in a seamless operation. I don't like to do that. That's just me. Because I want, before uploading it, I don't want to do it automatically. My friend uh, Bill Morton, who a lot of you met, W4ASC, is another beta tester for HRD. We agree that I don't want to have something uploaded that's not correct. So I want to correct it before it gets uploaded. Okay, this is just a little flow chart that will explain what happens. You go open TQA. TQSL, you request the certificate. ARL gets it. They send you the postcard. You enter the password that they send you, and it generates a certificate. Ignore this, unless you're a DX station, because that's non-US. But that's on the flow chart. Okay, this is what you see. I cut out all the commercial junk that surrounds it, that supports LOTW. But this is what you'll see to log in to LOTW. And this is the form that you're going to bring up. In here, you can go and you can put a, a, a wild card, it's called. For example, if I wanted to know what stations I've worked in Jordan, the prefix for Jordan is JY. So I want to know all the guys I worked in Jordan. I'll go in here and I'll put in JY asterisk or JY question mark. It's called a wild card. And it will bring up all of the stations that I've worked. And you can do that with anyone. Okay, this is an actual <laughs> screenshot from when I asked for the status. Where, you, of course, you see this, the, the entity or country involved, that means it's confirmed. Where it's blank, they haven't confirmed it yet in LOTW. I left that intentionally because if you do it, it'll only show you all the QSLs that you have, and this will take you to see what you need. Okay, remember I said you, you can do a wild card? I wanted to know how many stations are worked in Kosovo. Prefix is Zulu 6, that's 6. So I put in here Z6 asterisk and it brought them up. Now, if you notice this, and you look at the date, it's not, that's still Serbia, because Kosovo is not an entity until later on, but it's gonna show any prefix with the Z6. You can do logbook of worlds, you can do uh, your DXCC, WAS, you can use VUCC, or it will even take some of the CQ awards that they have made an arrangement with. So there are a lot of things that you can do. Uh, if you want to know your account status, 
This is actually my account status. And it breaks it down by band and total and current. There are 340 entities at the present time. But I have credit for 347. How in the heck did you do that? Smoke and mirrors. Actually, you have credit for deleted countries. So there are countries like Abu Ail no longer exist, okay? I still have credit for Abu Ail, which is a lighthouse. But how it became a country is beyond me. It's probably like Scarborough Reef. So that one you have built stilts. So, and it breaks it down. Now you'll notice, that's a pretty good activity. 160 meters. I don't have room for a 160 meter antenna. It's too darn big and I don't have it. And another one that you can work on, for example, it shows here that I have a five band DXCC with endorsements for 12, 17, and 30 which means I have an eight-band DXCC, but I also have it in modes such as digital, CW, sideband, and mixed. This is the challenge award. You have to have a minimum of 1,000 to qualify for the challenge award. Uh, I'm working on that. It requires new contacts. So I'm at 1188 and counting. This is a matrix. You can have the matrix. Years ago when you got a report like this from the league, it was on uh, what we used to call green bar paper. Do you remember the old computer oh, yeah. green bar paper? It's hard to figure out. Now, I clipped it off just so it would fit the screen. You notice it says Ab Abu Ail. It says, yep, yeah, I got it. But that was before LOTW and before they digitized the log. But they know that I have that confirmed. You can do it, as you can see right here, by prefix. You can also sort alphabetically by the name of the entity. And it will break it down for you. That's called a matrix. Okay. What you're looking at is what you'll see when you bring up your window in TQSL. When you see that little shield thing, that means you have a certified copy of a certificate. And you can upload, renew, display from the TQSL window. This is showing a couple of days ago a couple of entities, that were new, not new, but bands or modes and I haven't uh, uploaded them to award credit yet. I wait until I have at least 15 or 20 because um, the fee, there's a basic fee involved. Okay, again, you'll click on where it says sign and upload automatically to LOTW. LOTW is pretty smart. If you put in a duplicate virtually instantaneously, I mean, <laughs> before your finger's off the key, it's going to come back and say, hey, you already put that one in. And you just tell it, exclude the duplicates. You don't want duplicates in your log. I don't know why anybody would want, but what can I tell you? Okay, as of 15 September, that's how many records have been entered into the system. And 208,000 records have resulted. You have 121,704 users, 177,000 certificates, and there's a bunch of files that have been processed. That's of the 15 September. Okay, now we're going to move ahead. And this is called an online DXCC application. You can do this as well, but it requires an extra step. Using the online uh, system, 
you have a form which you'll see in a moment. You can enter your cards and you have to take the cards with the form to a field checker. In this case, locally, uh, it's Bill Barr, W-N4NX. Uh, He's the field checker. There's another one down in South Georgia. Or if you go to a ham fest, they'll probably have checkers there and can do that. The nice thing is, you don't have to send your cards to the bureau. You don't uh, to the ARL. You don't want to lose your cards. It's the only record you have, and you don't want to lose them. So you you fill out the form, print the list, and you take it, and the checker will note any changes. It's the same as before, except he or she doesn't need to collect the payment. And once they get it, there is no human error involved because nobody has to do data entry as you had to do with the old forms. And it was subject to errors. And I've had some errors that happened, and it's a mess to get them corrected. And the rate for an online DXCC is about half of a traditional paper QSL application. Cost, lower. Application fee, half those. Accuracy, absolutely, because no typo errors. You enter it in. And when you enter in on the online form, you do not have to put them in any order. On the old form, you have to put them in, a, in an alphabetical format because it required data entry. And if you had a 10 meter contact and a 20 meter contact, you had to put them in separately. With the online DXC, see, you don't have to do that because you're entering in the data and all they're going to do when they get it up at headquarters is upload the file and if the checker has signed off on it, it gets processed and that's it. Okay, it's fast, it's convenient, and it's neat, it's great. Okay, this is what the form looks like. And you'll notice I have one entry. You enter them one at a time and then you tell it to say. In this case, it's uh, Vito Leo, ON6VL, who's a friend of the club. And you put in the date, the band, and the mode, and automatically it will pick up the entity, except if there are multiple entities that share a common prefix. So you'll have to tell it which one, like a good example would be Chile, CE. But Chile has a bunch of other islands that are separate entities, so it's going to ask you, oh, which one is this? And you just tell it and it enters it. This is what the application looks like. And that's what you're going to take to the checker. And it has the call sign. They sign off on it. And that's it. And that's the record sheet. So it will list. It doesn't matter the order, mode, etc. But that's actually one of mine. Uh, you will put into the online. This is relatively new. It's called OQRS. Online QSL Request Service. It's great. OQRS is uh, an integral part of Clublog. Uh, you do not have to be a member of Clublog to use this. It's helpful because you can upload your logs and look for other matches and uh, you can request if you want a QSL card or you can have it sent direct to you as a, a fee set by the other station. Uh, or you can have them send it via the Bureau. And that's free. Yeah, I know. Hate free. So uh, if the person is a <coughs> excuse me, registered user, for example, I entered in here Esco, Echo Whiskey 8 Whiskey, which is Belarus. And it shows how many stations have been logged, my call sign, N4FN. It will show what contacts I have 
and it'll come back and say, oh, got a contact with them on 30 meters and 20 meters, both data. And then I can come here and say, request a QSL card. And then what will happen is this form pops up. And if you're a user of CloudLog, it'll fill the data in. It takes it from the log that you submitted to them. If you're not a user, then you have to manually put it in. But it may not agree with what my log says, but that's, that's what counts. So you see here, direct or direct bureau bureau, and it'll say new. And then what happens is you look at that and say, yeah, I want to go direct. And it's going to come back and says, uh, every six QSOs is two bucks. We can't mail for two bucks and get your card back. Can't do it. So I said yes. Then you'll notice at the bottom it says it's not finalized until you proceed to the checkout. And then you go to the checkout. So that's Club Log. Uh, it's, it's really nice. A lot of DX stations use this because the last thing in the world is they want another US QSL card. They have boxes of them and that does away with the QSL card. Okay, I thought you might be interested in seeing where all this comes from. And um, finally, after 60 years, I decided how my station should look. Or at least I think so. A little bit of nonsense. I do have, have that sign hung up in my shack. This is what it used to look like. And it, let's just say, um, like Windows, which I hate, uh, that was not user friendly, especially if I had to change cabling. And you'll, you'll see why in just a moment. When I pulled it apart, <laughs> that was behind the station. Believe me. I told Nancy, not only is she my best friend, my wife, but she's a great supporter of ham radio. And when I asked her one time if she would be interested in getting a license, in, as I say, 1.2 nanoseconds, she said, for 30 years in the school system, I walked around with a portable radio. I've had enough radio in my life. <laughs> anyway, this is what it looks like now. And this was, the station was actually designed by Paul Kelly, W4KLY. Paul and his son, uh, Scott, are master carbon cabinet makers. And almost as good as Bob Hensey but, and Jim Stafford, but not quite. Anyway, they, they built this, they designed it, and when they got ready, they sent me a big cardboard piece in the back with little strips of wood. And they said, arrange your station the way you think you want it at that time. And I did that. I made cutouts of all the station equipment and moved them around. I said, okay, this is what I want. And that's what they delivered. When they delivered this, and it was in four pieces, there was not one sixteenth of an inch out of register. That's how good they were and how good they are. I first saw this in Johnny Beckman's station, my old friend W4BTX, those who can remember those years. Uh, by the way, that, well, that's the radio I'm using now, which is an FT5000, and I also have an Elecraft K2, that's the main components, 
and the amplifier is a KPA 1500 also from Elecraft. That is not a K4. It will be. <laughs> I got tired of looking at a big hole. So I called Madeline Gomez at Elecraft. I said, I'd like you to send me two of your brochures. Okay, why do you want two? I said, because the inside is a full-size faceplate of a K4. She said, I know that. She said, look, she says, you're right. I said, I know. <laughs> I took it, mounted it on a piece of cardboard, because I was tired of looking at the empty hall, and there's my K4, which probably won't be until November, December, as they say. Okay. This is what I use. Uh, I, I use four monitors. I like working with the four monitors because it displays a lot of information. And I really like Martha's Geochron when I actually saw it for the first time. And that's a, a what they call a Geochron 4K. That's a 43-inch monitor. Okay, and that's just a different view. By the way, that's the Arabian Nights Award. It's all in Arabic, and that's from and signed by JY1, who is uh, King, who was King Hussein of Jordan. And I said to my friend, one of my friends, Anas Kalaf, JY4KA, I said, "Come on, Anas, when you're the kingy poo, you can give yourself any call sign you want." So he's JY1. Just another view, and oops, I, I went backwards. Pardon me. What's behind the white door? That's what's behind the white door. When they designed it, they had a 30-inch space. And I said, can you make it 36? They said, yeah, no problem. We just move the wall out. And so you can imagine what that would be. Right here is just, I don't need to see this, a Canon printer. This is this power supply for the amplifier, it's separate. So, when the station is in operation, there are blinders that drop down so you don't see through and see all the wires. And the faceplate is black. So you don't, you don't see anything. That's a classic station. I'll mention very briefly, when I was first in the hobby or thinking about it, uh, one of my neighbors, an uh, older gentleman, Mr. Morris, I don't remember his last name, he had a Hamerlin HQ-170. I said, wow. Well, 1956, I wasn't making a heck of a lot of money. I was just out of college. And that thing was definitely not in the budget. I said, someday I will own one. Well, I found one at Dayton, and it was, I think, like 150 bucks. Not that I could afford. <laughs> However, I forgot how heavy those things are. <laughs> it reminds you of what a boat anchor is. That's it. And I got partially back to the car. I was with Brian, W1DOC. And I said, Brian, if you want to save me from a heart attack, you're going to help me with this damn thing. <laughs> when I said that, one of the guys at Dayton pulled up on those scooters, and I said, you want to be a nice guy? Take me to the car. And he looked, he said, yep, yeah, I'll do it. And he drove me right to the car. And then I picked up the rest. But a little bit of nonsense about this. Mr. Hamelin had one lady who did the screens. There is no screen that is the same, the grid. She would sit there with a little paint thing and go whatever you know floated her boat every and it was in the Hamelin archives whatever design she did so that none of them are the same and that I is the matching I know to new people that's a little bit different than what they have today this is just as heavy and then that's the HX50 which 
came from the museum at W4QO. <laughs> he, has, he has more classic stuff. And in case, uh, where's Gary? Oh, he ran away because I was going to show him my, my Georgia mug. Here it is. Okay. Yes. That's my final thing. Don't annoy, torment, or anything. And if anybody wants that for the shack, drop me an email. I'll be happy to send it to you. You can contact me at my call sign at ARL.net or uh, narfil.org if you need any help. Up here, there are some, thanks to uh, Jim Stevens, old, uh, what I call original log sheets if you'd like to have one. And the countries or entities that do not have a bureau. And that's it, folks.